Rabbi Manus Friedman. Hello. <laughs> Thank God it's Tuesday. And as I just told our audience, um, that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of punishment these days in our lifetime. A lot of sin, a lot of sin, but doesn't seem like there is a lot of punishment. So this is actually the topic that I would love to speak with you today about and to get a clearer idea of what exactly a reward and punishment is in accordance to Torah. Maybe we're expecting something that doesn't exist or maybe we just don't understand. <laughs> okay. Well, one thing is for sure. We're not praying for punishment. Never. Um, but let's, let's examine the subject, the way it's presented in, in the Torah. Every action has a consequence because the actions are significant. So if you do a mitzvah, that's a significant, powerful act and it's going to have consequences. It's going to create uh, reverberations. If you do a sin, that's a serious act. The sin has negative substance, so it's going to create a disturbance. That's understood. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. <clears throat> so at first, we could say every sin has a reward, has a punishment, and every mitzvah has a reward. It's the natural consequence. It's not God handing out gifts or God uh, getting frustrated and, and taking revenge. The consequence of your sin is negative. The consequence of your mitzvah is positive. That's what we call reward or punishment. We're told that the punishment is always commensurate with the sin. Like if you sin in speech, somehow you'll get punished through speech. If you sin in, uh, with your eyes, you'll get punished somehow by, it will always match. So the obvious question, which get at it, we'll get this out of the way immediately. Every punishment matches a sin. So the punishment of the Holocaust, what sin does that match? No, it doesn't. There is no such sin. Jews did not go out to murder millions of people. So the Holocaust was not a punishment. Not even the consequence of our sins. It's a total mystery and only God someday will explain it. But until then, unacceptable. So not every pain is punishment. Every punishment is pain. But not every pain is punishment. That's not a logical conclusion. Like, for example, the exile in Egypt, 210 years. For which sin? We hadn't even been given the Torah yet. So there was no sin. And it was not a punishment. But when there is punishment, it must match and be commensurate to the sin. Person sins unintentionally. The punishment is a sacrifice, uh, tshuva. Person sins intentionally, it's a whole different thing. So when the Torah says, for example, 
if you if you are not if you don't if you eat chametz on Pesach, punishable by death. So everybody who eats chametz on Pesach dies. Obviously not. Why not? Well, for two reasons. First of all, only if you sin intentionally does the punishment apply. What does it mean to sin intentionally? You have to know what sin is. You have to know what God is. If you know God and you know what the sin is and you do it anyway, then there's a punishment because you're a destructive force. But if you're doing it out of ignorance, if you're doing it unintentionally, if you do it accidentally, of course there's no punishment. That's number one. Number two, this sin carries a death penalty, let's say. But then there are mitzvahs that bring you long life. So what does God do if a person sins and is deserving of death, but he also did a mitzvah that is deserving of life? Uh, now he's stuck. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> so you would think the person should die immediately and then be brought back to life because you don't get punished for every individual sin. You get rewarded or punished by the, by the weight of the good versus the bad in your life. So if you did a hundred mitzvahs and one sin, you get rewarded because the good outweighs the bad. It could be, for example, that a person did a hundred sins, but he did one magnificent mitzvah that outweighs the hundred sins. So who can judge these things? Who could know these things? That's why we are not allowed to judge. The Tanya says, you should feel inferior to every person you meet. And it has to be sincere and real. How is that possible? I know I'm a very observant, orthodox, religious, from Jew. I do everything right. And I meet a guy who does nothing right. I'm supposed to feel inferior to him. How does that make sense? So most people say, well, you fake it. Act like you're inferior, even though you know you're far superior. That's not true. That's not kosher. That's not what the Torah is about. There is no make-believe. So when the Torah says you should feel inferior, it means you have reason to feel inferior. What is the reason? So the Rebbe says, you're looking at a guy who is sinful and you look down at him, bad, don't sin, you shouldn't have sinned, stop sinning. What would it take for this person to stop sinning? He is so exposed, he is so vulnerable. He is so uneducated, unprepared for this battle. And yet, if he doesn't put in a battle, and if he doesn't struggle to not sin despite all the temptation, you call him a loser. Have you ever put in an effort not to sin? To you, it came easy. You were raised properly, 
you live in an environment where people don't do these things, so you don't do it. But the one sin that you are guilty of, how hard do you try not to do it? Let's say you'll never violate Shabbos, you'll never eat anything not kosher, you keep every holiday, etc., 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 but you like to talk negative about people. That's your weakness, that's your sin. How hard do you struggle? How much effort do you invest in not doing that? So it turns out that the guy who sins, like by committing adultery, is condemned for not trying harder to resist the temptation. But you don't try harder, so who are you to judge him? When it comes to your weakness, your temptation, you don't work so hard. So a person can say, well, that's true, but look at the difference in the sin. He's committing adultery. I'm just gossiping. How can you compare? True. The sins are not comparable. But we're not talking about which is a bigger sin. We're talking about who's a better person. When it comes to being a mensch, you're the same. He doesn't struggle, you don't struggle. So don't feel superior. Then the Rebbe says, okay, you got me. We're equal. But you told me to feel inferior. How am I inferior? The answer is, you know. You were privileged. You were given a Jewish education. So you are closer to God than, than, than the guy you're judging. If you're closer, then your lack of effort is more offensive. You've studied, you've been taught, you've been inspired, you're surrounded by holiness and you still can't make an effort. Whereas the other guy, true, he doesn't make an effort. But you can hardly blame him. So you're inferior. Because you've learned more, because you know more, your sin could be considered an intentional sin. The guy you're judging, his sin is unintentional, it's out of ignorance, it's out of assimilation, he was never taught. So how do we judge people? How do we know who deserves what? Just by looking at the list of sins that are punishable by death? The sin is punishable, but not the person. Because although he committed that sin, he committed it unintentionally. Or he also did a hundred mitzvahs to balance it. So when we read in the Torah, this sin is punishable by this punishment, that's the sin. It doesn't mean every person who does that will receive that punishment because a person is more than one sin. And so it is so wrong, inaccurate against the Torah to say, oh, you see that person, he deserves to die. Yes, that's what it says. No, it doesn't say he deserves. The sin is that kind of sin. Now, it's very much like a medicine, modern medicines. They produce medicines and they find out that they make people sick or actually kill people and they have to withdraw it, put, you know, take it off the shelves. So what happened there? Well, it worked on rats. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's going to work on humans. It works on diseased tissue 
but you can't give it to a living person. So, yes, this medicine kills bacteria. It kills bacteria, not people. If it kills people, it's not a medicine. So, that, that needs to be understood, that all the punishments in Torah describe the sin, not necessarily the sinner. Make sense? Uh, yes, Robert Friedman, definitely does. Thank you so much. However, um, um, it always has been that people understand uh, reward and punishment as karma, which is sort of what we're talking about. Not exactly, but okay, if something bad happens to somebody, they start to reevaluate what have they done wrong recently in order to deserve whatever has happened to them. Um, so is this completely wrong? This is not at all a uh, reward and punishment that uh, God has intended? Absolutely. But there's a difference between others when you're judging others or you're judging yourself. A person finds that he's suffering from whatever, God forbid, and he says, you know, it's probably because of my sin. That's, that's wonderful. Whether it's correct or not is irrelevant. Because if you say it's because of my sin, then you're going to improve your behavior. You're going to become a better person. So whether it's true, accurate or not, doesn't matter. It's a good thing. You're at least getting some moral improvement out of the pain. So you're using the pain positively. So if a person says for himself, I probably deserve this pain for my sins, that's that's very that's very positive, it's very it's very noble. But if you say that about somebody else, what are you doing? Where's the benefit to that? Um, Rabbi Friedman, but so it is a good thing to have this fear of doing something wrong with the consequence of punishment, um, I guess, even though um, from your teachings, I understand um, which your teachings and the teachings of the rabbi is that um, it's better to have fear to disappoint, to, um, you know, to make a mistake out of respect obviously for God, but also for someone here, you know, a friend, a parent, a co-worker, rather than have the fear of being punished for whatever wrongdoing you have done. Rambam says, not as a theory, but as a, a ruling, a halacha, the person who does mitzvahs because he wants to go to heaven, or whatever reward, and he avoids doing sin because he doesn't want to go to hell or whatever punishment, is not doing it right. That's not the appropriate way. That is used to educate children, ignorant people, unlearned people. You tell them there's a punishment, but that's only temporary until they learn so they get to know what godliness is, what their soul is all about, what their mission is all about, then they have to switch. So it's an interesting question. If you're talking to a child or to a person who has a hard time studying, he's just not intellectually gifted, then you use the reward and punishment approach. When, when do you switch? Or better yet, a person who has never learned anything, but he's a very educated person. He's never learned Judaism. But you're not talking about a child, you're talking about an adult. And you're not talking about a person who has a hard time understanding. He's a genius in everything else. How do you approach this person? Do you start with the reward and punishment? Or does he not fit that category? A 
person who is intelligent, you don't treat him like a child. So even though he has not yet learned, but he is an intelligent, uh, active mind. And so you tell him the truth in the first place, you don't go with the reward and punishment. That's the ruling of the Rambam. So it's not open to debate anymore. That's the right way to teach people and to inspire people. So again, why do we need to know about reward and punishment? Only as a childhood uh, teaching method? No, can't be. The reward and the punishment are a vivid description of the nature of the sin. What is it about this sin that deserves a whipping and the other sin deserves death penalty and the third one deserves a fine? How, do, how does that happen? How, how does God choose the different punishments for the different sins. So when you're told this sin, whoever sins will be cut off from his people, he will die. What is it about this sin? So the punishment is simply another detail in understanding the nature of this particular sin or the mitzvah. For this mitzvah, you will be rewarded, rewarded both in this world and in the world to come. Oh, what is it about this mitzvah? So it's not meant to be our reason for doing or not doing. It's a little more information about the mitzvah or about the sin. So every mitzvah has commentary. You eat matzah on Pesach, how much matzah? When do you eat it? Before the bitter herbs or after the bitter herbs? What blessing do you make on it? How do you make matzah? What makes matzah kosher for Pesach? So, so there's a lot of information about the mitzvah. One piece of information is how much godliness does it produce? Or what is the reward? Do it for the reward? No. The reward is a detail. You don't do it for the detail, you do it for the mitzvah. But it helps to know that this mitzvah is special in this way. It carries this reward. Or this sin is different, it carries a different punishment. Amazing, Rabbi Friedman. So this gives value to uh, good deeds and bad deeds. So it's pretty much just gives the understanding of... Um, value that's that's what it is and it's amazing wow never thought never saw it from this perspective but Rabbi Friedman how come we're still living in the time and there were studies made that people need to be fearful societies that fear punishment have a lot lower crime level than societies that are you know, that have a conscience, that, that are being basically um, ran, run as a conscious society, not a fearful society. So the conscious societies are not doing as well as the societies that are fearful. Can you uh, please explain why? Fear is a great motivator. <laughs> no question about it. And if you want to run a company or you want to run a school or you want to run a government, fear is very necessary and very effective. But that's because it's not a relationship. It's not a relationship with the government. So if the government has strict rules, that's fine. Nothing wrong with nothing missing. Of course, if you overdo it, you become murderous. But the mitzvahs of Torah, that's our relationship with God. So to simply say, do it out of fear, 
What kind of relationship is that? That's why doing it for the reward or the punishment is, is offensive. A man is good to his wife because he's afraid of her? What kind of relationship is that? So that's why Rambam is saying, if you think that this is all a, a way of achieving a ward and, and avoiding punishment, you're not in the relationship. One other thing. What exactly is the punishment in, in the Torah? Equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? It means that if you lean too far to the left, the punishment will be that you will lean very far to the right. That brings back the balance. Because you were very far to the left, if you lean very far to the right, you end up in the middle. So the Rambam says, when a person sins, he should go in the opposite extreme, and that will bring him back to the center. Which means, every punishment is really a corrective measure. There's no revenge. There's no, you hurt me, I'll hurt you. That's not God. If you cause damage, since he is your father, he will come and clean up the damage. Like, like parents who diaper a baby. You mess up, the parents clean up. Now, cleaning up might be uncomfortable to the child. Doesn't like being bathed in hot water. So, here's, listen, listen to this little uh, example. A father says to his son, you're running around barefoot. It's dangerous. Kid says, nah. The father says, you'll get a splinter. He says, so what? Big deal. He says, no, no, a splinter can get infected. So, well, if it gets infected, it can become gangrene. You, 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 might, you might lose a leg. Kid says, nah. He runs without shoes, he gets a splinter, it becomes gangrene, they take him to the hospital. And the doctor comes with these sharp, cold steel tools and digs out the infection and it's painful. But he saves the leg. Now the kid is all recovered he's all, and he's running around barefoot. And the father says to him, that's dangerous. Nah, you'll get a splinter, big deal. That will get infected. So what? Uh, but then we'll have to go to the hospital and get it fixed. Oh. He goes and he puts on shoes. <laughs> now, what just happened here? The father says to him, running around barefoot is going to cause damage. It's dangerous. It's risky. The kid says, no, I don't care. The father says, if it does happen, the doctor will be able to save your foot. Oh, that's scary. So he goes and he puts on shoes. So he's not afraid of causing damage. He's afraid of the cure. That is so immature. The cure scares you. So every punishment that God gives, including hell and Gehenna, it's all a cleansing process. It's all the healing. So you say, well, I don't mind creating damage and ruining everything, but, oh, that's what it takes to clean up? Okay, I won't do it. You're more afraid of the cure than you are of the damage. See, that's childish. And that's part of why Rambam says, if you're doing it because you want to avoid the punishment, you've got everything backwards. The sin is wrong, not the punishment. so it's so mature 
Reverend Friedman, I know you started by saying that we should never want um, punishment upon anybody. However, there's so much wrong in the world today, and we see the people who are doing wrong to the world and to other people, and um, and I guess um, a lot of us are not as holy, <laughs> who kind of do want to see justice happen and see those people um, pretty much, well, at least stopped, and the only way I guess they possibly can be stopped if something, if they're stopped in a harsh way, because it doesn't seem like um, uh, anything else will work at this point. Again, this is just us little people speaking. Well, I can relate to that. <laughs> I, they, they're still not in jail? <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, this is what we're saying. So, reward and punishment, it's not instantaneous. We don't see it in our times to people who, I mean, in our opinion, kind of deserve it. Um, but it doesn't seem, you know, there's, it still seems like uh, they're free to run around and do their own little nasty stuff. Um, how does that exactly work? How should we... So as a citizen of the state, yeah. <laughs> jail, jail time, prison, seems to be the answer. But as Jews, concerned with God's plan... We don't want jail. We want the people to recognize the wrongness of what they're doing, suffer terrible embarrassment, if that you know, can be considered punishment, and correct themselves and become as good as they were bad, which would make them very good. <laughs> Um, Robert Friedman, are we as a society ready to be conscious and not worry about punishment? Because a lot of people, I mean, um, your mantra is positivity and kindness. And um, I think for some people it's amazing and um, they can use it and improve the lives of their lives and the lives of others and then other people are so scared of this concept and saying no 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 without fear uh we can't really be good we can't really function we 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 need we need to understand that there's that kind of strictness out there that that's what keeps us going what would you say to those people who say that positivity and kindness uh can relax people too much and they can become you know not their best. It may be a reflection of their own thinking. They know what works for them and they're assuming that the same would work for everybody. Uh, there are also people who feel like education is not the solution. Don't educate, just punish. We don't believe that. We can't believe that. There are individuals, maybe, who can't be reasoned with, who can't tap into the goodness, the kindness, the, no, the, the, the nobility, the ideals. Most human beings are not like that. Most human beings respond to what makes sense, to what sounds decent, to what is noble, so why cater to the minority, to the lowest denomination, when you can educate the majority of people in a positive way? So yes, education changes people. I mean, a good education, not liberal arts. <laughs> and the beauty of, of a mitzvah will motivate most people. Don't, don't, don't condemn human beings as being animals and incorrigible. It's not true. And it's not nice. 
Rebel Friedman, I have to say that today I learned something that I have not learned anywhere else, and I try to study as much as I can. Um, not enough, always, of course, but um, there is no teaching. There's no. There, it's always like black and white. I hope it's okay that I said that right now, but it's always like uh, cut and dry. That's it. Um, so you sin. There's there's sin. There's good deed mitzvah and um but today you gave a dimension to both um which unfortunately i have not learned anywhere else and i think that is a, extremely important to understand that we are not reading into what we should be reading into the information that we have does not give this uh, depth to um to to the revelation that we we possess <laughs> not enough not enough revelation let's put it this way <laughs> well every every law book sounds harsh that's what a law book is now, tampering with what is what do they say on the airline tampering with the smoke detector in the in the in the bathroom is punishable by such and such and such Sounds pretty harsh. You're going to go to jail. But that's a law. That's how you present laws. Then there are the amendments. The amendments soften the law, always. They don't always apply. It's only under these circumstances, only if you can afford it, you know, like that. So, if you read only the written Torah, you do come away with an impression that we're all going to die. <laughs> we're, we're all sinners, we, we, we're doomed. But once you read the oral Torah, the, the, uh, the explanations that God gave to Moshe, then you realize that they're not as harsh as they sound. In fact, Moshe himself did that. Um, at the end of 40 years in the desert, Moshe says to the people, let's gather, gather around, I want to talk to you. Look at you all standing here alive and well in the presence of God. What he was saying was, you may have gotten the impression that the laws are so strict and the laws are so dangerous that there's no chance none of you are going to survive We're, you're all going to be dead that's right from the time of the giving of the torah now it's 40 years later you know how much you've sinned and let yet look you're all here healthy alive so you got the wrong impression torah is not out to kill you <laughs> Rabbi Friedman, but in all fairness, not all were, were well and alive. Some were punished by death. That was the exception. So, if, if we, I, Christianity is limited to the scripture. And that's very, sounds very harsh. So, it was almost like they had no choice but to say, the laws were canceled. The laws don't apply anymore. Otherwise, we're all going to be dead. That's because they didn't have the oral Torah that uh, fills in the picture. So the mitzvahs don't have to be canceled or they don't have to be discontinued. And we're not all going to suffer. Rabbi Friedman, but in all fairness, uh, we we're, we have this ninth of Av every year, which commemorates the fact that those who um, that the men who God told were not going to enter the land of Israel didn't. That a certain amount of men had to die um, on this one day every year. So um, so there is such a punishment where people actually knew they weren't gonna 
there was a punishment, punishment for the sin of the spies, which we're still, uh, which we're learning right now, actually, in this particular Parsha. Well, the punishment was not death. The punishment was not going into the land. But they died natural deaths over the 40 years that they were in the desert. All in one day? No. No. Now, um, even, even the destruction of the temple, first and second, that happened on Tisha B'Av, the people were guilty of sins that are punishable by death. So God said, I'm not going to kill them all. I'll destroy the temple instead. So even the destruction of the temple shows that you don't know how the sin is going to be corrected. You don't know how people are going to be punished or rewarded. So we shouldn't guess or assume that there's going to be death and there's going to be plagues and there's going to be, you know. By the way, concerning the fast of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the fast is meant to be a form of grieving, not sadness. They're easily confused but they're not the same at all. Grief is a holy thing. Sadness is unholy. Grief is a feeling of intense life. Sadness is no feelings at all. Very different. So we have to be careful. Tisha B'Av is not a time for sadness. Sadness can be very self-centered, indulgent. I'm in a bad mood, so I love Tisha B'Av. No, it's not, it's not there for your bad mood. Either you're grieving the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem, the loss of, of the temples, or, 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 or don't be sad. So grieve or don't grieve, but sadness is not is not acceptable ever, not even on Tisha B'Av. And too many people identify Tisha B'Av as a sad time. Not good. Rabbi Friedman, amazing. Thank you so much. Another very enlightening very spiritual very educational hour and um can't thank you enough for everything you do for the for our community for the world on daily basis thank you so so much and um um it's always sad for me for this particular (laughs) these particular moments are always sad to say goodbye and but unfortunately it's radio and I, i but the good news is We look forward to a lot more wisdom and insights from you next week. Bezrat Hashem. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so, so much, Rabbi Friedman.